Welcome everyone to this panel focusing on uh, the youth where we've recreated this uh, Greek ecclesia for uh, the purpose of this conversation. Uh, we're having uh, today exceptional voices from Europe, leaders and uh, great visionaries. This year represents a significant momentum as the European elections are a few weeks ahead of us. And this moment calls not only for active citizen participation, but also great awareness on the key issues that determine Europe's future and safeguard its democracies. Therefore, the panel discussion of today is more crucial than ever. And together, we'll talk about shaping Europe's collective destiny, one of stability, safety, democracy, innovation, and sustainable development. To discuss this topic, we're honored to welcome leaders and who were also past laureates of the Charlemagne Prize. We're happy to welcome on stage Her Excellency Dr. Dalia Grybowskaitis, former president of the Republic of Lithuania, Charlemagne Prize laureate 2013. Mr. Pat Koch, former president of the European Parliament, Charlemagne Prize laureate 2004. Dr. Jean-Claude Trichet, former president of the European Central Bank, Charlemagne Prize Laureate 2011, and Madame Veronica Tepakalo, Charlemagne Prize Laureate 2020, political activist and co-recipient of the Sarakov Prize. Let's start with a context setting question for your excellency. What do you see as the most pressing issue facing Europe today and how do you assess the risk posed by the ongoing wars that we're noticing? So I have an uh, uh, existential question for myself. Do I need to frighten you or to be politically correct? <laughs> Because we are not the best, probably, especially me, uh, not the best uh, for calm uh, talking uh, representa representative. And we talked just recently before coming to the uh, stage uh, with Mr. Khrushchev that he remembers what I was saying years ago about Russia. And he was not able to believe me, actually. And even after Crimea occupation in 2014, uh, then I was the first uh, politician who's who evaluated Russia as uh, practically having features of a uh, terrorist state. I was attacked by all my colleagues in European Union, including all political um, uh, uh, dis discourtants in my country, that I was too hysteric. And uh, now then I'm meeting some politicians, uh, including mm, at that time uh, was very critical Obama administration, Madame Clinton. Now she's saying, Dale, you have been very much right in 2014. Then I'm saying, why? you are not listening to me again. That's the problem, that if uh, challenges you face in Europe, including, are quite dangerous and uh, explicitly, visibly terrible, you just rejected them psychologically. It is probably the human feature you cannot believe. You think it will be not about you, about somebody else. And nobody thought that we will have in Europe, on European soil, in 21st century, the open, large, open scale, traditional, conventional war against its neighbor, against the nation, and in general, against Europe in general. Now it's still contained partly on the territory of Ukraine, but from hybrid point of view, as cyber attacks, as informational wars, we're already feeling heavily. I mean, all countries uh, are feeling that. And in interventions into the election process, not only on national level, but also on European level, also very much visible, which uh, directly is influencing the mood and swings and uh, our electorate uh, understanding uh, where risks are and who to be trusted. And in reality, influencing our election process in Europe. So from this point of view, uh, this challenge, which we started to see openly uh, almost uh, more than two years ago, uh, is ongoing. Uh, and I predict that 
confrontation with Russia will take decades, decades to come. It's not for just then war will finish. But this war or another war so will never finish until Putin will be alive. He has no choice but to go with, with the war because for him it is absolutely vital for his survival to have external enemies, external enemies and internal enemies. And he will go ahead or it will be Ukraine or it will be other countries around and also he's using Belarus as a uh, satellite for his uh, intentions together with today's uh, president in, in Belarus, who also uh, looking for external enemies and of course internal enemies and we will s hear what, uh, who is internal enemies already for Belarus. So these auto authoritarian regimes who are becoming a totalitarian regime, becoming a totalitarian regime uh, in Russia, in Belarus, we will be facing for decades to come such kind of cold war type confrontation. And it will be good if it will be on the cold side, if it will not split, uh, spill over in hotter forms, in, in more uh, military confrontational terms. So from this point of view, that's a challenge uh, we will need to manage no matter what elections we have, local um, states uh, or, or European. And plus, uh, you in your question was other uh, geopolitical uh, threats and tensions in the Middle East uh, and the form formation of geopolitical different unity who are becoming uh, confrontational to each other. I mean the uh, unity between uh, South, uh, between North Korea, uh, Russia and Iran at this stage, uh, which very much united militarily and economically and helping each other to avoid sanctions and helping each other to fight the war in both the regions, in, uh, in Ukraine, uh, in Europe and in Middle East. So here yeah, we are facing quite uh, difficult challenges and I think that will be uh, some kind of uh, tone or no matter what we will do, it will be b behind us, in front of us and with us, all these kind of tensions and we need to learn how to manage and never forget that geopolitics matters, politics really is local and people are voting local, but geopolitics will influence our lives in years, decades. This leads us to the question of governance for you, Mr. Todd. As former president of the Iraqi parliament, what is for you the key achievements of the Iraqi project and what does it mean today? I don't know if I can reduce it to the key issue. I think there are several key issues. I won't repeat what, what we heard from uh, President Davos Gait there. I agree that the geostrategic space has changed. I would add to her observations uh, the growing anxieties that many in Europe feel about the possible drift of United States politics to add another layer of complexity and anxiety to Europe's, uh, Europe's defence question. I think on that I expect that the next uh, mandate of European Parliament and European Commission and of members of the European Council are going to have to spend much more time looking at the strategic security and defense question, looking at how to finance strategic defense and security, and looking how to organize a capacity inside Europe not to go to war. Europe is not a war-like entity, but to be able to sustain a peace on which we place a high value. And when you are dealing with a neo-imperial bully like Mr. Putin, weakness counts for nothing except to be exploited. So Europe has a job to do. A second thing I would say, this is the 20th anniversary of the so-called Big Bang enlargement. Lithuania came in uh, at that time. And my own country, Ireland, joined in uh, January of 1973, 51 years ago. And if I look back at that or the enlargements that took in Iberian Peninsula or Greece um, as, as they uh, in particular made their way back to pluralist democracy, if I look at the um, 
success of the Big Bang enlargement in, in so many ways before they joined the countries of Central Eastern Europe in terms of their own prosperity had a level of income per head that was somewhere less than 50% of the then EU average. The EU average continued to grow, but today, on average, uh, countries in Central Eastern Europe that joined uh, now have a, an income per head of three quarters of the European Union average, and even more in Lithuania by some margin. This is truly impressive. And so I see the enlargements over time as one of the most powerful foreign policy instruments of the EU. They're foreign until someone gets in, and then of course they're internal. But I think they have been truly transformational. And if I go away from economics and look at other things, like lower rates of infant mortality, uh, greater longevity, people survive longer, these are all measures of, of, of quality of life. The same to do with education systems. So I think it has been powerfully transformational. Of course, we know there has been some backsliding to do with uh, values and courts and free media and so on. So I think we have lessons to learn. One big lesson is we shouldn't be afraid of enlargement. We should embrace it. It has been win-win in the past. It can be in the future. And secondly, we know that there are some issues we've learned from some of the states that joined who are not playing by the rules of the game that they signed up to in their accession treaty. And we need to be able to focus on that dimension to do with life inside the union after accession. So security, enlargement, I would say the other big issue, I mean, there are many issues, but I couldn't talk to a, an audience of, uh, of your uh, age without talking about global warming and climate change. Um, I think the European Union has been a great mobilizer of a coherent response. I know there's been political pushback, but bear one thing in mind. Politics works in various cycles and in electoral time cycles. But if we take the long time cycle post-industrial revolution, we can see a very simple piece of physics. The more greenhouse gas emissions you put into the air, the greater becomes the layer of insulation around the globe. And if you know about insulating a building to keep it warm, it's the same physics for the globe. We're still pumping more greenhouse gas emissions into our atmosphere. Consequently, the physics, not the politics, don't change. And the physics say things will get warmer. And when they get warmer, we know to do it. All of the downside risks, they get worse. So this is something I would say that must remain a high priority. Uh, already, we live with bad consequences of climate change. And if we don't arrest what's happening globally, your generation will pay a much heavier price than mine because I've less summers to live through than you have. And it really matters to me that we don't retreat from this necessary objective. Very clear, thank you so much. Madame Sapkalo, looking at the rise of populism and nationalism in Europe, what do you think the continent can do to protect itself better in, I ahead of those authoritarian influences? Well, uh, first of all, European Union is one of the best organizations in the history because, you know, for many decades, for, uh, for hundreds of years, the nations were fighting for each other. The two world wars started in the, in the European Union uh, continent. So we have to admit this is one of the best institutions which was ever created. But from the other side, because I represent the country which is not part of the, uh, of the European Union, and when we face the reality of dictatorship, when we face the reality of the stolen uh, elections in Belarus in 2020, when we face the hundreds, thousands, 45,000 uh, political uh, people who went through the prisons. When we face uh, the death penalty of the political prisoners, because you know, uh, the situation in Belarus with the human rights getting worse each and every day, and uh, we do not know the destiny of the political prisoners for more than one year, uh, and you know, like people really have fear that something might, something bad might, might, hap might happen to these people, like with Mr. Navalny's uh, case in Russia. So what we see that Russia, uh, 
they do have a lot of food uh, dollars is very important for Putin. Back in 2020, we didn't know, we had no idea that he was going to use our territory uh, to bombard Ukraine, to use our territory to, you know, to start this bloody war against uh, the people of Ukraine, which is very, very close to Belarus. This is from the uh, from one side. From the other side, we do we do have to admit there is no political will from the European Union countries. Uh, it's a populism. So what you just answer uh, ask me, it's mostly the populism. When we hear we call it quit democracy, when we see just tweets with the condemnations, the tweets when they say like we you know support you, but we don't see the real actions. We don't see the real steps towards to help us to fight the democracy, uh, to fight the, uh, uh, you know, autocracy regimes. And, you know, when we ask you, European Union politicians, to help us because we cannot fight by ourselves, uh, when we c you compare the help which Russia or Putin provides to Belarus with the help which uh, European Union or United States promises and do not deliver, it's hard to compete. You know, we are not in the same condition. So we call it populism because, you know, officially you say they write democratic things, but in the reality, when we collected the testimonies of those who was beaten up, who was tortured, who was put illegally in the prison, uh, and we asked the ICC to open the criminal case, we heard nothing from them. We sent them multiple letters, and you know, we asked them, we requested to open the criminal case about uh, uh, against Lukashenko. You know, there was a political will uh, against Mr. Putin because uh, ICC general prosecutor to open the criminal case against Putin. But in our case, we see no actions. Unfortunately, we see no actions. And the regime in Belarus, uh, Lukashenko, he started to create the new ways how to get rid of the political opponents, how to get rid of the democratic uh, fighters. For example, he, they started to sell our real estate, our property in Belarus, you know. My family, other families, we have three cases right now. Uh, all the property was sold out at the auction. I mean, even your personal belongings, your furniture, your kitchenware, everything was sold out at the, uh, at the auction and then the apartment was sold out and all this money went to his pocket. So, you know, he started the real fight against the people who fight for the human rights. And recently he made, Lukashenko made an uh, announcement that, you know, he's going to do the same to our relatives. So what does it mean? It means you will not see human rights fighters, you will not see any democratic leaders in Belarus in the next decade. Because people don't want to uh, don't wanna risk with the uh, uh, property or lives of their lo loved ones. That's why we call it populist. That's why a lot of Belarus people, you know, we are feel we feel so discouraged. We feel demotivated because we don't see any actions, unfortunately. Thank you so much. Moving to the question of economy, a lot of European citizens, citizens uh, feel <laughs> that they want to give their vote to radical parties today because of this issue of economic inequality. As the former, uh, you've led the European Central Bank for many years. How, how do you look at this question of economic disparities and how does it affect so social cohesion in Europe? Well, f first of all, I think that uh, we uh, are experiencing a move towards uh, radical criticism of our uh, societies, both in Europe, it's clear, also in the United States of America and in the advanced economy as a whole, and I would say uh, all over the world, to be clear. And uh, this move towards authoritarianism, towards uh, uh, dictatorship, uh, uh, is a very strong, uh, powerful, global move in my own understanding. And, and to understand exactly what is behind, I think that uh, uh, a lot of our citizens, uh, fellow citizens, I'm speaking particularly in Europe, are uh, first uh, moved by the fact that things are changing extremely rapidly. I must confess that the last seven years I experienced myself in my life are more turbulent, more dramatic since we discuss, uh, and you were so lucid in anticipating what will come in Europe, in your own country, but all over Europe, uh, all this is um, moving so rapidly, we are in a different world. 
Of course, economy is moving extremely rapidly. The, the technological changes are calling our uh, fellow citizens to accept changes, permanent changes, much more than in the past. And this is very troubling. Of course, also, we have the immediate communication of everything, particularly, fortunately, in our own democracy. And now everybody knows. And also with the, uh, I would say, so-called social network and the new technology, I guess that it also simplify, oversimplify the world. And uh, the young people know that better than anybody. I'm not on the social network myself. So I don't have this direct experience. But I know that my own sons and uh, grandsons and daughters uh, are functioning on this basis. So we are in a new universe. And I see this move towards extreme left and extreme right with a call for uh, oversimplifying the reality. And uh, uh, I would say the, the sentiment, which is uh, very profoundly uh, uh, enshrined in uh, the new citizenship, if I may, that even, even uh, not only the young people, but also a lot of uh, medium-aged people, that uh, if we would do this or that, we will uh, solve all problems. Now, what I could see also is that when the Europeans, to take the example of Europe, are taking a move which is a good move, in my opinion, and I will take as an example the euro. The euro was cons uh, under the uh, accusation as a concept of both the extreme right and the extreme left. And it was a very close call in many countries. In my country, it was accepted by 51.1%. In Germany, it was an extremely close call in uh, the Bundesrat. And so it was very, very complicated, very complex. Uh, I gave those examples. But now what I observe in the Eurobarometer is that the euro is backed with a, a very strong, I would say an overwhelming majority by our fellow citizens. And so that the good move was has proved in the eyes of even the uh, so-called extremists that it would be a very bad move to call for getting out of the euro area. I could observe that in my own country. Nobody is asking today uh, for a, a Frexit, if I may, and uh, for abandoning the euro. And I, I think this is an example and a lesson for, uh, for the uh, European. If you make good moves, uh, then it cannot avoid, if I may, to be recognized by the, our fellow citizen, by the people, as something which is obviously better. And I, th I trust that we still have so many things to do, and I would go along what Pat uh, said a moment ago, so many important things to do in so many domains including, of course, uh, defense, uh, security, uh, diplomacy. Because in my opinion, and then, then I express only my personal opinion, our uh, long-term goal is clearly to have some kind of political federation. When I compare the euro with the dollar, the euro is a full success as regards uh, the currency itself. And uh, it was said very, very clearly. Uh, as regards the equivalence with the dollar, of course, it's totally different because the US is a political federation and we are not. So you have only one market for the dollar instruments, the bonds, and you have segmented market, many, many markets in Europe. So the difference is enormous because on the Bund, the German Bund or the French what OECs or the Italian uh, bonds, the difference in liquidity and depth of the market is 1 to 15. So we are in totally different universe. And I could multiply the examples. But I know that I'm very bold in saying that in my perspective, we are progressively, and of course, uh, 
gradually, very gradually to be clear, uh, going in the direction of uh, political federation. Thank you very much. We'll open the floor to our future leaders. If some of you want to ask questions, is the moment to touch on many different topics. Um, Miranda, there is a mic behind you. Hello, everyone. My name is Miranda Lolo. I'm an academic winner of the Charlemagne Prize for this year. Thank you very much for this uh, great panel. Uh, my question revolves around one of the biggest challenges, the accession of Ukraine, as well as the recovery and rebuilding of Ukraine will be the biggest challenges the Euro EU has faced maybe similar to the Marshall Plan after the Second World War. Um, and I have two questions on that. As you mentioned, um, the European Union is constantly in this relationship with Ukraine right now, negotiating the recovery packages, harmonizing laws. What is something that you wish the community in Brussels would do differently this time in comparison to previous accession processes and in comparison also to the Western Balkans, what are some of the things that you wish they would learn? And maybe also a second question in terms of time, it was mentioned things are moving very rapidly. At the same time, many people would say things are not moving fast enough. Um, how would you negotiate this push and pull of the time in this process? Who wants to take I, I can start, uh, probably the, somebody will help me. Uh, the process of negotiations for membership is always very much individual. You have uh, uh, some kind of um, basket of regulations, but finally, decision is very much political. Then, a window of opportunity opens. So, that means that we cannot predict that the negotiations will be going in the same way, in the same time frame as it was, for example, for our time. It could be faster. And we, we cannot predict even then it will happen because we do have very complicated situation with the war ongoing on the territory. And this complicates very much uh, uh, what kind of uh, territory is negotiated in, uh, what kind of uh, financial support will be given, how long traditional, ter uh, traditional territories will be, especially, for example, on agriculture, on, on structural funds, even us. Uh, we're already 20 years in, in, in European Union. We do not receive 100% the same agricultural sub, uh, subsidies as uh, all uh, countries have. So there's a lot of possibility, variations, but the main thing is political will. Nothing else matters. If political will and decision will be to help Ukraine, making them a members of European Union, uh, to help them not only to fight back, but also to restore themselves, it can be done. We uh, negotiated, and it took up for us about 10 years, about 10 years. But we went through all, all procedural things, four treaties, association, free trade, whatever. I, I'm sure that it will be a different uh, uh, case with Ukraine, because uh, time changes, necessity changes. Ukraine under pressure, not only Brussels, but under pressure of war, is doing a lot of things faster and rap more rapid and more uh, efficiently. This is very good. This pressure is also good for Ukraine because they able to persuade their population, persuade political elite, persuade everybody to do these reforms. So I think this, uh, everything on European uh, membership is uh, put it on very good background and is going very efficiently and under control of both sides. Ukrainians themselves, their government and their parliament, and also from uh, uh, our member states, European member states and European Commission. So uh, here I do see only the mm, window of opportunity uh, and uh, nobody will say then it will happen. Everything today very much depends on what happening on the field of war. So that's the largest influences of any, any possible engagement with, with Ukraine in the future. Thank you. Mr. Sok, do you want to jump in? Well, I, uh, I agree. Th this is a very political process always. It required constant unanimity to agree to confer candidate state status with uh, one member of the Council 
uh, I don't know what, heading out for a cup of coffee yeah, yeah, or it's whatever, coffee break, yeah. uh, which created this unanimity. It requires from the General Affairs Council unanimity to agree a framework for negotiation. It requires unanimity to open one chapter. It requires unanimity to close one chapter. And in the end, when it's all done, it requires unanimity for an accession treaty. So a hypothesis, not a, a scenario, not a prediction. If you were a bad actor who didn't want this, you can put your leg out and flip it up many times. As regards Ukraine itself, I think the enlargement won't happen while there's an active war for a variety of reasons, including that you don't actually know the de facto territory that would be joining. The second thing I think the whole case of reconstruction of Ukraine post-war needs to be a large multilateral effort in which the EU will be a player, but not an exclusive one, which makes it rather different to the classic pre-accession process because of the scale of funding and needs that would be there. If we took Ukraine in its de jure sense, suppose all of Ukraine in the 1991 sovereign border was at some moment restored, that would make it the largest state ever to join the European Union. It would be relative to GDP the most agricultural state to join the European Union. It would be to do with GDP per capita the radically poorest state to join the Union. If you are the biggest, the most agricultural and the poorest, and you look at the current system in Europe, you should be getting more of the money from the common agricultural policy in the current system and more of the money from the cohesion and regional funds because of your relative poverty. So straight away what has been said about, you know, overhauling the European budget to deal with some of this is a necessity. So there are two bits of homework. One of them is Ukraine for Ukrainians and one is Europe for itself. Europe has to be able to absorb the enlargement and that will require an institutional absorption capacity. We can grow, it can be win-win, but it should never become gridlock. So there's an institutional requirement. And the second dimension is the budgetary one which will not be negligible. The last thing I would say from an enormous amount of contact that I have uh, constantly in recent years with the Verkhovna Rada of Ukraine, including most recently work with them less than one month ago in Ukraine, the factions, the political groups in their parliament and the parliamentary speaker and deputy speakers are hugely committed to fast tracking as fast as they can whatever it is Europe is saying they need to do. Now, of course, we can't confuse just rubber stamping a key communitaire legislation with a capacity to absorb and implement, which is more complicated, but they're up for it. So we should not underestimate Ukraine's determination to hit the accelerator. And the very final thing uh, I would say on this to do with a broad European interest, again, a scenario, not a prediction. Imagine that a rump Ukraine, a failed state, and in a constant state of insecurity, existed on our eastern border. That would be a source of enormous instability. So we have a stability requirement on our border to actually help Ukraine to be a stable and, and coherent state when the war finishes, not just to be nice to Ukrainians, but to recognize the geostrategic stability of our own EU eastern flank. Thank you. Dr. Trichet, do you want to intervene on this? Uh, I have a declaration of interest to make. My wife is of Ukrainian origin. <laughs> so <laughs> my two sons are half Ukrainian, if I may, at least uh, uh, as regards the origin. Uh, and of course, we follow in the family what happens in Ukraine with enormous uh, attention, horror, uh, and uh, we, we are not, I have to say, uh, uh, optimistic when we see all that is happening. And I would echo uh, what was said by the my neighbor, president of, former president of Lithuania, and uh, by Pat Cox, I think all what you say is extremely wise, and, uh, and but that the, the difficulties we will have to surmount are enormous, absolutely enormous.
Madam Secretary, would you want to intervene on this question? As you just said, you're the future politicians from the European Union. So as the person who is coming from the country where people are suffering every single day as we speak, where number like uh, 1,500 political prisoners, the, the, uh, the prisoners who are recognized, you know, officially recognized, but there are up to 5,000 political prisoners in Belarus who are not officially recognized. So I would suggest to you, I know EU is a huge and complex institution, but make a decision much faster. Because every time we fled the country in 2020, it's been four years, and within four years, we were sending multiple hundreds of letters to EU government, to prime ministers, to the president. We launched so many initiatives to help Belarus and to help Ukraine as well. Because for example, in Belarus, you're putting the prison for anything, even for, the, to, for making a donation to Ukraine. Mm. If you would like to make a donation to Ukraine or to Belarus uh, troops, which are you know, like uh, fighting with Russians on the territory of Ukraine, you're put in the jail, you're put in the prison. Therefore, you know, like think about every second you spend on, on making a decision. Because this very second, somebody dies in the prison. Somebody dies in Ukraine. And once again, if European Union help and the United States, don't, and don't get me wrong, I'm talking about both European Union, United States, help, have helped Belarus back in 2020, when we, or even in 2021, when we were reaching out hundreds of politicians, member of parliament, uh, member of EU states, etc., and at least to help us to fight with Lukashenko, with uh, Putin, you know, there wouldn't be a war in Ukraine in the first place. And now when the war is there, and when we, as I said, when we ask, when we reach out for the, some decisions or help or anything, it takes forever to make any decision. So my advice to, your, to you, to, your, to the future politicians, just make sure you, I know the, you're very complex, you're a big organization, it's multiple countries, you cannot make the decision on behalf of the other country, but always remember time plays against us in these conditions when we talk about dictatorial regimes or uh, just keep it in mind and act as fast as possible. Thank you very much. Elena? Yeah, Sarela, I'm Elena, I'm also a fellow. I actually want to ask two questions. The first one's to the young people in the room, which is um, if you're going to, please raise your hand if you're going to use social media to inform yourself about the elections this year. <laughs> I mean, and so based on this, I wanted to ask to um, the panelists, which I, I thank a lot, and the moderator for the interesting insights um, I think that your insights um, depicted a very complex geopolitical situation, um, but unfortunately on social media, which are often privately owned, um, complexity has to be um, simplified, also based on how they're um, on the structure of social media and the, the, the code that goes behind that's binary. So how do you think, um, you also spoke about a call to action, how do you think is the best way to communicate to young people who are going to inform themselves there um, in a way that depicts complexity in platforms where things are going to be um, at least simplified, if not polarized by the nature of the, these platforms and to also make um, this not just a way to inform people, but also a call to action on these very relevant issues? Thank you. Who wants to go first? <coughs> uh, we uh, may be four or five uh, generational difference. <laughs> <laughs> so in our times, which are not interested for you, we <laughs> had our own methods, how to persuade and how to pass the message. In your case, you have uh, your different tool, but what is in common probably uh, uh, between uh, political generations that for politician, it, what is important to be truthful and to be able to persuade. And this usually you can do not only with technological tools, but also with the substance. How serious substance is, how substance is shortened, analyzed, and how it will target directly to the emotion. You 
it's not about information. Information, you can Google it. It's about, are you touching emotion? Are you persuading? Are you trustful as politician? And that's non-generational. That's for everybody the same. Only then differs, uh, for example, uh, a generation uh, in my times, in previous times, it was about how nice you and long you can talk. Now, with t Twitter language, at least three, four, maximum five words, which need to be precise, chirurgical, targeted, and straight to the audience. So that means you need to know your audience, you need to know what you want to say, and you need to have the tools, how fast and how impressive you can do it. But for that, you need yourself to be a leader. The leader usually, you see, is the person who takes responsibility for one or another decision or question. And if you feel confident, try to persuade another person or group of people with your truth, with your emotional attachment, with your goal. That's non-generation. And everything else, uh, just case by case. We cannot generalize a lot of such kind of methodics, but even now we need to learn and uh, run after technological um, changes. D during pandemia, for example, I, as a president, I had a lot of assistance, and pandemia brought me to my office, and that's it. And I learned how to do uh, video on the internet with, uh, with Facebook, Twitter, uh, other um, uh, technological uh, videos and all these kind of things. But that's exactly the life is pushing you to, to learn the technology and tools, but the substance, uh, the personality matters. The leadership of personality matters, no matter what generation, no matter what uh, country, no matter where. So here, that means if you want to be a politician, the main uh, regulation or request for you, you need to know not only to know what you want to do and what you are going for, but you need to learn how to go from the knowledge up to the end of implementation. And we have in Europe, for example, a lot of leaders who are capable to talk nice. And I will not mention one name, but you know <laughs> that political mm, strategies and political nice um, speeches with a vision of Europe sounds very fine. And you listen once, <laughs> you enjoy it. But then a year or two, follows nothing. I mean, no action, no implementation of these nice visionary uh, views. So that's the most difficult part to being a politician, not only to know. To know is an expert. They know. You can ask for advice. You can Google information. Not only to know, but to learn how to implement this knowledge to the practice <coughs> or to the reality. That's the most difficult um, uh, uh, part of being politician, plus always, always, it's personality and always responsibility to risk even with your personal position, with your personal life, if you want to become a leader in politics and to achieve something. That's always difficult, always risky. That's, a, I would say, what's the job in, in, in the world. If you want to go for it, you need to know what you're going for. Thank you. Mr. Cox, is uh, technology challenging our democracy? Look, a thought that crosses my mind, which is not a direct answer to your question, but which arises from your question. In the United Kingdom, the most disappointed post-Brexit cohort were young voters. In the United Kingdom, the most socially networked generation of potential voters were young people. And in the United Kingdom, the lowest turnout by age category were the youngest people. So social media activism and political effect need to be distinguished from each other. A vote counts, a tweet or an X or whatever it's called today, 
doesn't. It may impress, it may offend, it may do whatever, but it's not engaging in a very basic act of democracy. And I think a lot of times uh, in today's social media environment, which is a very interesting phrase, people in fact are more isolated than connected in their communication. They're connected electronically, but at a human level, they're more isolated. And I think certainly, I mean, it is a case that we belong to a generation where you had to go and eyeball the public if you wanted their vote. You've got to look them in the eyes and you've got to take whatever they're going to throw at you and you've got to try to deal with it. And I find this kind of thing much better because you're not confined to, you know, 140 characters trying to turn a universe of complexity into a reductio ad absurdum where you bring it down to a point where in fact you're not really communicating substance at all. So these media are there, they can't be ignored, but they're not a substitute for a more active, personal, human involvement if political issues and if political values really motivate you. I'd like to take the question from the gentleman. Uh, I'm Gonzalo from Spain. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, my question was uh, arised when we were talking about Ukraine before, uh, in which we were mm, discussing about the role of the European Union in the future of uh, that situation. But uh, the reality is that the big biggest part of military aid to Ukraine comes from the United States. So my question goes in two ways, one more geopolitical, one more uh, economic, and maybe Mr. Tiche will uh, can answer. The first part would be um, what future do you see for the war in Ukraine if Donald Trump won the election in, uh, in the United States this year and uh, whether that could change everything we've been talking about right now. And uh, the other one focused more on the interior policy in Europe. Um, in, the, in his first term, uh, President Trump and put uh, tariffs in uh, certain European products, such as, for example, in Spain, ol olive oil, also German aluminum, <laughs> um, which are the m business relations have been have gone better. So, what prospects do you see if uh, mm, Donald Trump won again in the United States, both for physio-political situations in Ukraine, which extends to defense in Europe in general, and uh, economic-wise? Uh, to trade, for trade with the United States. Thank you. <coughs> One word. It is terrible to think that we are depending to that extent on an election in the United States of America. Uh, of course, uh, uh, it's normal that when you have alternance uh, in any democracy, you have changes of policy, but, uh, and of trade policies, perhaps. But imagine that it could dramatically change the situation on the defense uh, side for the Europeans. So uh, as I said, I, I really trust that the long-term future of Europe is not to be depending to that extent on, I would say, one nation, a democratic nation that we all love. But uh, when I look at the long-term evolution of the world, I see the following. In terms of geostrategic influence, at the end of the century, each European country taken isolated, isolated uh, is number 23, 24, 25 power in this new world of the end of the century. And that, that is not acceptable. We would be totally marginalized. So I see the absolute necessity personally for Europe to be more deeply united and be able to have by our own its own influence. We cannot rely eternally on a country which uh, has its own interest, uh, considers that Europe is, in any case, it's a bipartisan vision in the US. Europe is less important than Asia. And I can understand that pretty well, seen with the appropriate uh, US uh, glasses. So we are in a 
clearly situation where, in my opinion, European defense is becoming progressively a mess. I am sure that the uh, country will not be elected in the US, so uh, I think we should not over-dramatize what could happen. But we are not in a situation where we can say, by our own, we are uh, our own masters. And uh, maybe I'm a little bit too gaullist in this yeah, respect. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I know that. <laughs> but, but I'm speaking of the long term, madam. Yeah, long, long term, term 20, 30, 50, yes, yes. Okay. But not near this time. No, not now, of course. But it would be our fault. Yes. If it happens now, absolutely. it's uh, Washington. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can add a little bit on geopolitics because the first part was about geopolitics and elections. Uh, for us, for Europeans, uh, no matter what kind of election outcome will be. Because what we think already is a tendency, not these last four years, but Trump first four years, that United States already became very much divided as society and trying to withdraw from its global position of obligation, securing their, not only economy, but also securing their uh, defense uh, of some regions, including Europe. So, so it generalizing, uh, I don't care who will win, even thinking differently who will win, because it is clear in one or another uh, way, for us, for Europeans, there is a necessity to take more responsibility, even full responsibility for, Euro for European territories' defense on our side. That's very clear. Today, about 80% of a NATO military force is in U.S. hands, and we are not able to defend our territories, of course, without U.S. support. But I, I am not afraid at all of Trump coming here. Why? Because in 2018, I had a possibility to deal with him, being in NATO summits, where we tried to say NATO something uh, at that time, uh, but it was not so difficult to say, uh, to, to, to do, because he's predictably unpredictable. What that means, it's not only bad. No, 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 I'm serious. He's unpredictable to himself, because he do not know what he will do in two minutes, because he's able to concentrate his attention only two minutes. I'm serious, because I knew it, and I was able to manage it. Uh, you need to be prepared. Second, he is unpredictable to his friends, but also to his enemies. And if he will realize that Putin is beating his butt, he will hit me. While I'm not sure that today's administration will be able to do it. What we are seeing today, quite weak leadership from White House. I'm sorry. And that's exactly, I'm saying that U.S. withdrawing from its global responsibility, no matter who is in position. What that means for Europe is more responsibility needs to be taken by ourselves, even not in long term, but now. Putin and situation in the US not giving us time to relax and to plan long term future. It is today and, to, uh, and yesterday. So why I'm saying, no matter who will win in this, for us, in both cases, there will be more job to be done, more responsibility to take, and more to pay ourselves for our security. Very good. Thank you very much. We said we have to finish this conversation here. Please applaud this amazing panel today. <laughs>